What is up, fellow nerds, and welcome to Not Your Status Quo. I'm Keith, and today we are doing a Mon Calamari deep dive into the history of the Mandalorians. Okay, that was kind of a fishy way to start things, Keith, but hey, I'm Dave, and if you like what you see here, please like and subscribe to our channel. Yeah, really fishy, but anyways, I'm Doug. Now, I'd force you to tell your friends about our channel and ring the bell to be notified of future content. But that's not the way. So I'm going to ask very nicely, please. Here we go. With The Mandalorian Season 2 coming soon to Disney+, Plus, curiosity in the culture and history of Mandalore is at an all-time high. It's been of interest to Star Wars fans for years because of the popularity of Boba Fett, who wears the armor of a Mandalorian, but we learned through the course of Star Wars Clone Wars that the iconic bounty hunter was not actually a member of the culture of Mandalore, and neither was his father Jango. At this point, however, it's still a mystery how they came by their iconic Mandalorian armor, though these secrets might be revealed in season two, at least a bit. You don't have to be from Mandalore to be a Mandalorian. Cara Dune and Din Djarin made it clear in season one that, and we quote, Mandalorian is not a race, it's a creed. So who are the Mandalorians? What is their history? What makes them tick? And like any fully realized fictional culture, the history of Mandalorian spreads back for thousands of years. And in terms of the Star Wars universe, this means that their history goes back to a time even before the formation of the Republic. Uh, yeah, Keith, it's kind of like in a, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Anyway, this is the way, but why? The Mandalorians were once strong in numbers, but now um, they're only in little par pockets scattered around the galaxy. Many were lost in the Great Purge, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but this phrase, however, um, explains something about the Mandalorian people. As brutal as they were, uh, they all bonded in a strong way, and they live uh, by a code that they all adhere to. So when they say, this is the way, to Mandalorians, it's like saying, uh, may the Force be with you to the Jedi, or I have spoken to Quill. Uh, a phrase that shows the past atrocities are acknowledged, without saying anything else, and uh, they will all be on the same wa wavelength without question. So the first time that we actually hear this iconic phrase is in season one, episode three, titled The Sin. This occurs when Din Djarin meets with the armor and the other members of their tribe. It's also where the so-called creed is first mentioned. So Din's tribe actually lives and dies by this creed, which at the time that we meet them includes a prohibition against removing their helmets in front of any living person. This also includes the obligation to win fights honorably, the need to stay hidden, and the prioritization of the children. Actions derived from following the creed are then punctuated by the declaration, this is the way. Mandalore itself is positioned in what is known as the Outer Rim. Its closest neighbors include Yavin and Dathomir, but it's the same area as Tantooine and Genosius. From the films, we know the Outer Rim to be a place where the Republic has little, if any, influence. Mandalore was completely independent of the Republic and did its best to remain neutral to the Separatists and that caused significant problems for them during the Clone Wars. In its history, the planet was once a lush paradise, but after centuries of war, the humans who lived there were left to live in massive domed cities. True canon Mandalorian history is hard to figure out. It's unknown what elements from previous novels, comics, and games will be folded into their history and background. It is true today that the first Mandalorians uh, did in fact originate from the planet Mandalore, an outer rim planet in uh, the leader of the Mandalorians was called Mandalore, translating to soul ruler. Years of war left the planet in inhospitable, uh, forcing the Mandalorians to live within dome cities, like, like Keith has said. Um, in the past, the Mandalorians are quickly expanded and uh, took over their sector and even tried to penetrate the galaxy's inner rim, only stopping once the Jedi pushed back. 
So in Star Wars canon, the history of Mandalore actually stretches back to the oldest eras of known history in the universe, a very long time ago in a galaxy even further away, one might say. Mandalorians actually began as a warlike people, always seeking conquest in the days before even the Old Republic. This warrior culture eventually led to a need to colonize and conquer other nearby systems. Those Mandalorians that were sent off into these battles were then known as Crusaders. Two noteworthy planets that were conquered by these sword-wielding, space-faring Crusaders were Crown Nest and Concord Dawn, both planets that were seen in animated Star Wars tales. Concord Dawn bore the largest scars from the Mandalorian conquest, as the planet was literally shattered, fractured from the war that had racked the planet. These attacks weren't even limited to the Outer Rim either. The Crusaders made their way in as far as the Inner Rim of the galaxy. Though their territory appears to have shrunk in the later years of Republic. So the trouble with this era of the timeline is that all we have are vague references to it. Spoken secondhand through characters or in reference books. And that tends to make it uh, even more oblique mentions. And because of their bloody conquests, the Crusaders eventually caught the notice of the Jedi Order... And this sparked generations of war between those who would dedicate their lives to conquest and those who sought to keep the peace in the galaxy. They commemorated the battles in their artwork, which implies a healthy respect for their Jedi foes. It's said that the Mandalorians were unstoppable conquerors, but the force abilities of the Jedis confounded them and they were forced to adapt against their new foes. It was in these fights that the weapons and armor that, the icon that are iconic to the Mandalorians were developed. Each layer something designed specifically to counter the force abilities of the Jedi. When one chooses to walk the way of the Mandalore, you are both hunter and prey. How can one be a coward if one chooses this way of life? Said from the armorer, they are truly a race of warriors. Beskar, also known as Mandalorian steel, was an alloy used in uh, Mandalorian armor. Notable for its high tolerance for extreme forms of damage, uh, the metal was durable enough to withstand a direct blaster shot and could even repel lightsaber strikes. Wearing this distinctive armor, they were feared throughout the galaxy and had political influence um, over 2,000 star systems. Regarding the Mandalorian armor, though, Serene Wren once uh, explained to uh, Jedi apprentice Ezra Bridger on Star Wars Rebels that Ezra, the armor I wear is 500 years old. I've reforged it to my liking, but the battles, the history, and all the blood um, and lives within it, um, it's the same for every Mandalorian. Due to civil war, uh, Mandalore was split between those who sought a peaceful society and those who held their violent roots. So we'll go on to the Mandalorian War. In the years prior to the Clone Wars and even before the Crisis on Naboo, Mandalore's united clans split once more, thrusting the planet into a prolonged civil war. The Jedi Qui-Gon Jinn and his Padawan Obi-Wan Kenobi were involved in one side of the war, helping the pacifist House Kreis survive against the more aggressive clans and houses that wanted to plunge Mandalore into further war and conquest. Master Qui-Gon and I spent a year on Mandalore, Obi-Wan Kenobi recounted, on the Clone Wars, protecting the Duchess from insurgents who had threatened her world. They sent bounty hunters after us. We were always on the run, living hand to mouth, never sure what the next day would bring. Eventually, the pacifists, led by the Duchess Satine Kreese, won the conflict and Mandalore spent decades at peace. They refused to take a side in the Clone Wars and ultimately paid a price for it. And despite these prolonged wars with the Jedi, there were definitely times of peace enjoyed in the galaxy. It was during one of these lulls in the conflict that Terra Vizsla was brought into the Jedi Order, the first Mandalorian to ever have done so. According to the, according to the journeyman protector Finn Rao, as he recounted the story to Jedi Kanan Jarrus in Star Wars Rebels, Terra Vizsla's entry into the Jedi Order took place over a thousand years before the Galactic Civil War that we know so well. Because he was the first Mandalorian to become a Jedi, he was revered among his people. During his training with the warrior monks, Vizsla crafted what became known as the Darksaber. It was an ancient design of lightsaber with a black blade. 
According to Rao, uh, Tarvizla was able to free himself from the Jedi Order uh, enough at some point to rule over Mandalore, uh, uniting all the clans. During this time, the Darksaber became a symbol of power to the Mandalorians he ruled, specifically his own um, clan of Vizsla. Unfortunately, after his death, the Jedi took possession of the weapon and opted to keep it safe at the Jedi Temple. This didn't last long, though. At the dawn of the fall of the Old Republic, Clan Vizsla raided the Jedi Temple and took the Darksaber back. It was recognized as a symbol of authority for the ruler of Mandalore, and it could only be passed from one owner to another with a trial of combat. Else the claim the saber would be the claim on the saber would be considered illegitimate. Wielding the dark saber, a Mandalorian named Pre Vizsla, who is voiced by none other than John Favreau himself in the Clone Wars, took a splinter group of disaffected Mandalorian clans and then formed a terrorist organization named Death Watch. Now, Death Watch was dedicated to toppling the pacifist government of Mandalore in order to bring about a return of Mandalore's warrior past. A quote here, we are the Death Watch, descendants of the true warrior faith, all Mandalorians once knew. Now my people are living in exile because we will not abandon our heritage. Our people were warriors, strong, feared. Now they're ruled by the new Mandalorians who think being a pacifist is a good thing. They've given away our honor and tradition for peace. Duchess Satine and her corrupt leadership are crushing our souls, destroying our identity. That is our struggle, said by none other than Pre Vizsla. Death Watch and the legitimate gov government of Mandalore fought bitterly in a series of engagements. Count Dooku, leader of the Confederacy of Independent Systems, secretly supported Death Watch, which complicated matters for the Republic since Mandalore had stated their neutrality and they couldn't interfere without starting a diplomatic crisis. There was a way around that, though. Because of his prior involvement with the Duchess, Obi-Wan Kenobi's presence was personally requested to help settle the conflict. Eventually, Death Watch's repeated failure to capture Mandalore was enough that they sought new allies and found themselves in alliance with Darth Maul and his brother Savage Opress. With Death Watch uh, backing Maul, the former Sith Lord was able to gather uh, the criminal underworlds of the galaxy, including the Pike Syndicate and Black Sun, into what became known as the Shadow Collective. Using the Shadow Collective as a ruse, Maul had um, these criminal forces attack Mandalore and uh, had Death Watch rescue the people from the terrible fate, thereby provide, proving that they were more capable of protecting him or protecting them than. Um, Duchess Satine. This worked out and Duchess Satine was overthrown and Death Watch took control of the government with Maul as its head. I am Pre Vizsla of Clan Vizsla, he told the people of Mandalore on the Clone Wars. Death Watch is here to save you from these intergalactic gangsters that threaten our great city. This is a war and we will win. Join me and let us defend Mandalore against the criminals. We need action, not pacifism. Naturally, Pre Vizsla worked to take the planet back for himself and replace Maul. But things did not work out for him. Maul actually killed Vizsla and then the Duchess Satine, and he kept control of the planet for himself. When Darth Sidious finally removed Maul from the equation, Bo-Katan, a former member of Death Watch and sister to the Duchess Satine, was named the Regent of Mandalore, a position she held only briefly. After the conclusion of the Clone Wars, the Empire took over the galaxy, and Bo-Katan was not sympathetic to them. Clan Saxon, led by Gar Saxon, was loyal to the Emperor and took control of the planet with Imperial backing. During the Imperial occupation of Mandalore, with Gar Saxon as Imperial Viceroy, young Mandalorians such as Sabine Wren were forced into Imperial academies. At these schools, Mandalorian youth were trained to fight for the Empire as Imperial Super Commandos, but also forced to do research and development that would aid the Empire in pacifying the planet. During her time there, Sabine Wren was forced to design and build a prototype weapon 
that specifically targeted Mandalorians. Sabine's weapon, called the Arc Pulse Generator, was capable of superheating the metal to the point that it would burn to a crisp and everything it was protecting, as in the case of Mandalorian warriors encased within their Beskar armor. However, Ren was able to destroy her weapon during the Mandalorian Civil War. She named it the Duchess. Sabine left the Academy and escaped Mandalore when she came to her senses and eventually joined up with the Rebellion. For his part during the Dark Times, Gar Saxon led an elite group of Mandalorians that became known as uh, the Imperial Super Commandos. They were deadly enforcers um, of Emperor Palpatine, and their armor became a blend of Imperial and Mandalorian styles uh, to pay respect to both of their masters. These super commandos ruled Mandalore with an iron fist and terrorized the galaxy at large, helping Mandalore live up to its warrior roots, just as Death Watch had hoped. As the Galactic Civil War began to coalesce at the end of the Dark Times, as documented on the animated series Star Wars Rebels, many Mandalorians were growing ready to fight back against the Empire's oppression alongside the rest of the galaxy. Sabine Wren was able to finally recover the Darksaber from Maul on Dathomir, and she used it to unite some of the more disaffected clans of Mandalore, including her own clan Wren. It began with the rebel Sabine Wren traveling to the ancestral home of Clan Wren, the Mandalorian-controlled planet of Crown, Crown Nest, and there Sabine sought to reconcile with her family, but Gar Saxon and his Imperial Super Commandos arrived to attack. In the conflict, Gar Saxon was killed at the hands of Countess Ursa Wren, tossing Mandalore into a new fight for power. Because the political situation was so fraught, Mandalore was unable to offer the Rebellion any assistance at that time. It wasn't until the Battle of Antalon where Grand Admiral Thawne engaged the Rebels of Phoenix Squadron, as seen during Star Wars Rebels Season 3, that the young Jedi rebel Ezra Bridger was able to escape the blockade and convince the Mandalorians to enter the conflict. Mandalorians, led by Wren's led by the Wrens, helped the Rebels survive that conflict so they could regroup on Yavin 4. The Rebels, in turn, would offer their help to Clan Wren as they infiltrated their still Imperial-occupied homeworld and free it from the reign of the Saxons. With the death of Gar Saxon, the rule of Mandor was left to his brother, Tiber. Tiber Saxon was as much or more of a tyrant than his brother, um, and he set to work rebuilding the weapon of mass destruction designed originally by Sabine. The rebels led by Sabine uh, and a group of Mandalorians led by Bo-Katan uh, destroyed the weapon and liberated the planet. It was at this point that Sabine uh, gave Bo-Katan the Darksaber, installing her as a rightful leader of the newly free Mandalore. To date, there has been no new information about the fate of Mandalore, uh, we're not sure what happened to Bo-Katan uh, after she took control or how long she even had control. And when did Moff Gideon get the Darksaber? Will we learn more of this about in uh, the Night of 1000 Tears? All right, so the next bit of information that we're going to talk about is classified as legends. Therefore, it's not canon. So a little bit of word of warning. However, the reason why we're bringing some of this stuff up is uh, some of it is um, some of the elements that are that I'm about to talk about. They've been referenced in the Mandalorian. So now, again, according to legends, the first Mandalorians were actually descended from a group of uh, individuals known as the Tong. Now, they were an ancient species of humanoid simians, and they were actually indigenous to the galactic core world of Coruscant. Sound a little familiar to some of you guys, right? So the Tongs were actually warriors from youth, and they viewed battle as a source of honor, both for the individual and their gods. Tong society was nomadic and clan-based, something that obviously carried over into, uh, you know, um, current-day Mandalorians. And uh, veterans of successful campaigns were actually honored, and they were looked upon with reverence. These battle-tested elders ended up becoming the chieftains, or the de facto leaders of their clan and their community. Now, higher authority came only from the Mandalore, which Dave spoke about a little bit earlier. And that was a title that meant sole ruler in the Tong language. So that's where that actually originated from. 
And it was a role that embodied a single leader of all of the warrior clans. Eventually, after hundreds of years of war, the Tong were driven from Coruscant and fled to the outer rim of the galaxy. Their leader, Mandalore I, found another planet in the outer rim, a world of multiple ecosystems, uninhabited by intelligent life, and dominated only by a race of non-sentient creatures of colossal size known as mythosaurs, and claim this new planet as their own. You are a Mandalore. Your ancestors rode the great mythosaur. All right, so to kind of round this all out, we got a little bit of uh, info that's worth mentioning, but uh, doesn't really fit, so to speak, in the rest of our overall video, but, uh, you know, definitely worth mentioning. Now, the name Mandalorian, where this actually came from, it's a, it's a little um, unusual, you, you might uh, think. Now, George Lucas himself first was uh, kind of verbally calling Boba Fett a Mandalorian. Now, obviously, that has changed since then, but the first time that it was actually in print was in a Star Wars comic that was published by Marvel in the 1980s. It was eventually established that Boba Fett's father, Jango, stole the armor that was worn by both bounty hunters from a real Mandalorian. But yeah, it was actually first in that comic book where it was referring to Boba Fett and Jango Fett, or rather just Boba Fett, really, as a Mandalorian. So Moff Gideon, we spoke about him earlier, uh, now current owner of the Darksaber, he started off serving as an officer in the Imperial Security Bureau, which is a law enforcement and intelligence agency of the Galactic Empire. In the last episode of season one, it's revealed that he knows both the Mandalorian and the former rebel shock trooper when he reveals their full names, Din Djarin and Kara Cynthia Dune. Gideon also mentions that Din is what is known as a decommissioned Mandalorian hunter. Now that's definitely worth thinking about. Din also reveals who Gideon is to Cara Dune and Grief Karga, explaining how he was an ISB officer during the Purge. Now, the Great Purge occurred sometime in the Imperial area against, um, era, sorry, against the Mandalorians by the Galactic Empire. It was during this time, uh, that Mandalorian Beskar was gathered and it was cast into Imperial smelters as spoils uh, of the Purge while most of the Mandalorians were killed. The event that led the Mandalorian group known as the tribe uh, operating in secrecy uh, after the fall of the Empire. Din Djarin was a, found, a foundling uh, raised in the fighting corpse and when he became of age, he uh, was sworn to the Creed. The Fighting Corps uh, were a specific unit, like the Night Owls, uh, within Death Watch, uh, the warrior faction of the Mandalorians. Thanks, everybody, for watching our history of the Mandalorians. Did we miss anything? Anything important that we may have overlooked? Let us know down in the comments. And thank you for watching our video, and we'll see you next time at Not Your Status Quo.